Good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad you're all able to make it today and um, find some parking nearby. I've never seen the State Library parking full like that before, but um, anyway, we all, we all manage. So um, welcome here today. Um, my name's Lisa Dunn. I'm the uh, privileged to have the position of being the CEO for the Australian Alzheimer's Research Foundation. Um, and before we begin, if uh, I'd just like to pay my um, acknowledge the traditional owners on the land in which we're meeting today and their, um, pay my respects to their elders um, past, present and emerging. Uh, if I can just remind you to... Oops, that's to the end. Okay, go back to the beginning. Just remind you to um, turn your phones off or onto silent, please. So Professor Martins, who many of you will know, um, is unfortunately not able to be with us today, um, but he certainly wanted me to pass on his welcome to you all and your, his sincere thanks to many of you who participate in the research programs that are conducted at the Foundation. Um, and of course, without that support, um, much of this research work could not continue. So um, he uh, certainly wanted me to pass on his thanks and welcome to you all today. Um, I'd also like to thank our, our presenters who are here today. We have four really interesting presentations. I think you'll find them all really, really um, interesting and, um, and I thank them very much for their time they've given today. Um, also welcome, as I mentioned, to those of you who participate in our research. Um, great to see you here today. Um, some of you may have been participating in the ABLE study and Stephanie's going to give us a, uh, a really interesting update on what's been happening in that study over the, I think, 15 years, um, she'll correct me if I'm wrong, that that study's been going. Um, and also just welcome to our other donors and supporters who are here today. It really is a, a group effort to enable us to achieve the results. Um, more importantly, the researchers to achieve the results they do. So thank you everyone for being here and for your support. Um, I'm probably telling you things that you may already be aware of or are witnessing in your own life and family and friends and perhaps yourself uh, that dementia's a significant scourge on society, a major challenge that we have. Um, I think we've had some amazing inroads on challenging many of the chronic disease issues in society, um, but dementia really still sits there as um, something with uh, major challenges for us and uh, a long way to go perhaps in, in achieving some of the hopes we have to make this um, something we don't need to live with in the future. Uh, dementia, including Alzheimer's disease, is the number one cause of death in Australia for women. Um, second leading cause overall. Um, approximately 70% of people with dementia have Alzheimer's disease, but there are other causes of dementia as well. There's about 100 diseases that can result in dementia, but Alzheimer's is certainly the most common and will be the key feature of our talks today. Um, two thirds of um, people in aged care residents have um, a level of cognitive impairment, either moderate or severe. So in our aged care systems, um, it uh, is a significant challenge. Um, and without a significant breakthrough in an ageing society like Australia, it's, um, it affects an enormous number of people and will continue to be. Um, and of course, all the people around them, their families, their carers, their friends. So I think we're all here today to hear some, some good news about some of the um, research that's going on and some of the things that we can do to help reduce our risk um, and stay healthy. Um, just a very quick overview of what we do at the Australian Alzheimer's Research Foundation. We conduct clinical trials into um, new drugs that are being trialled for Alzheimer's disease and Dr Roger Kleinett is going to talk to some of that today. Um, we provide funding for Alzheimer's um, research that's conducted here in Perth um, and also some collaborations across in New South Wales with Macquarie University. We provide um, some of the research facilities and support activities to enable the researchers to really get on and focus on what's important. Um, and of course, we fundraise to provide those services without receiving any government uh, funding. Um, our fundraising and philanthropic support is critical to ensure our work can continue. 
So without any further ado, um, I'd like to really welcome our first speaker, Associate Professor um, uh, Stephanie Rainey-Smith, um, who obtained a PhD in neuroscience at King's College in London um, and uh, at an NHMRC Emerging Leadership Fellow as a Senior Research Fellow at the Australian Alzheimer's Research Foundation and at Murdoch University. Um, Stephanie has published over 109 peer-reviewed journal articles and publications um, and uh, in 2019 won the Australian Institute of Policy and Science Young Tall Poppies Science Award in recognition of her outstanding medical research and excellence in communication and community engagement in promoting and understanding medical research. Um, uh, Stephanie is the principal investigator on two um, additional sleep studies that are being conducted both here and um, over in New South Wales. So um, I'm sure you'll find her talk very interesting today. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Lisa, for that warm uh, introduction. Um, I'm just about recovered from laryngitis, so I don't quite sound as I usually do, but hopefully my voice hangs in there for the duration of the afternoon. As Lisa correctly stated, I just want to talk to you about the ABLE study, and a number of you in this room will likely be participants of that study. And I want to tell you about uh, the significant achievements we've made over the last 15 years, and why participating in observational studies such as the ABLE study is so important to the work that we do. And I also need to start by acknowledging the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation as the traditional custodians of the land um, on which Murdoch University stands. And we acknowledge uh, their past, present elders and their emerging leaders. So given that I'm the first speaker uh, this afternoon of our four um, speakers, I would like to start by broadly defining dementia. And it's an umbrella term for a large group of illnesses that cause a decline in an individual's functioning, which includes but isn't limited to memory, social ability, intellect, and physical functions. And as Lisa mentioned, um, Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia, accounting for around 70% of cases. Uh, the rest of the cases can be divided between multiple uh, conditions, including vascular dementia, dementia with Lewy bodies, and frontal temporal dementia. And Lisa also summarised um, the information on this slide, so I won't say too much beyond the fact that the prevalence of um, Alzheimer's disease and dementia due to Alzheimer's disease is increasing, um, partially because um, it's due to um, its likelihood increases with advancing age, and we are, of course, experiencing an increasingly aged population. It's a gradually progressing uh, disease, so Alzheimer's disease starts a very long time to cause the deficits that you... Um, that you experience when you walk into a doctor's um, office or into your GP clinic and, and complain about symptoms. So what we know is that the changes in the brain start to accumulate decades before someone is diagnosed. And these, um, so an individual moves from being cognitively normal, so they have normal memory and thinking, but there are changes occurring in the brain, into a stage that we refer to as mild cognitive impairment, which is when they demonstrate some abnormality on tests of memory and thinking, but their day-to-day -day living is not affected into the stages of dementia, uh, where, which are mild, then moderate, then severe. And when we look at what's happening in an Alzheimer's brain, we can see uh, from the image on the left-hand side here that there, are, there is loss of tissue in the Alzheimer's brain, and the regions that are involved in language and memory are particularly affected, which is why an individual with dementia due to Alzheimer's disease has trouble recalling words or also remembering familiar things to them, such as people and places. And when we look under the microscope, the changes that are responsible for this loss of brain cells and ultimately um, brain cell death um, are shown on this right-hand side image. Those purple blobs there, they are neurons or brain cells. And you can see that in the normal cell, they look fine. And in the right-hand image, where you can see the Alzheimer's brain, they're starting to experience a lot of damage. And this is because between the brain cells, you've got those brown blobs. And they are deposits of a sticky protein called amyloid beta. And it accumulates between the brain cells. It's toxic to brain cells, and it can cause their death. 
And also within the brain cells, you have something called tangles or neurofibrillary tangles. And they're made up of a protein called tau. And this protein tau is usually involved in maintaining the structure of the brain cells. But in the case of Alzheimer's disease, it becomes what we refer to as phosphorylated and even hyperphosphorylated. And this causes the structures to twist and tangle on themselves. So you've got this two-pronged attack. You've got the toxic environment created by the amyloid outside the brain cells. And then you've got the toxic environment within the brain cells from the tangles, both of, of which result in the brain cells not functioning normally and ultimately dying. So, in 2006, a study was launched called the Australian Imaging Biomarkers and Lifestyle Study of Aging, which we refer to as ABLE. And it's a prospective longitudinal study of around 2,500 participants. And what that means is we follow people over time, and we've been following them over time for a very long time now, but we are constantly enrolling new individuals into the study. Around 40% of the ABLE study participants are based here in Perth, and the other 60% are based in Melbourne. And the aim of the study is to improve understanding of the causes and diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease and help develop preventative strategies. And individuals come in uh, to the clinic and they're assessed at 18-month intervals. And some individuals are all the way up to 144 months of follow-up now. And some are even beyond that, I think, actually. I think some people are now in for their 162-month um, assessment. So it really is a tremendous commitment from the individuals involved. And the ABLE study is what we refer to as a multidisciplinary study. So we have been collecting data for a very long time on cognition, so memory and thinking, also on brain imaging. So we tend to use um, different types of brain imaging to collect information about the structure and function of the brain. Also biomarker data. So um, anyone who's involved in the ABLE study will know that we collect a blood sample from you, usually a fasted, well, always a fasted blood sample in the morning. And within that blood sample, we look for signatures or hallmarks of the disease. And this can help us understand um, early diagnosis, so getting understanding when people are at risk of developing the disease in the future, and also understanding if someone is likely to have the disease at present. And what really sets ABLE apart from other studies of its kind worldwide is the fact that we have also been collecting comprehensive lifestyle data for around 15 years now. And this includes information on sleeping habits, um, on physical activity, which um, Associate Professor Brown will speak about in the next or, or after Hamid, I think, and also about diet. And we've been using that information to understand how lifestyle impacts someone's likelihood of developing Alzheimer's disease in the future. So this table shows us that we collect data from individuals who we refer to as cognitively normal, so they have normal memory and thinking currently. Also those who have mild cognitive impairment, and that's the stage I mentioned earlier, where individuals currently have uh, normal day-to-day -day, um, functioning, but if you test their memory and thinking, it, you do see some impairment, and those individuals who are diagnosed as having Alzheimer's disease. And we have collected over 8,500 person contact years of data, which is truly amazing. And what have we learned from all these data? And the answer is a lot. And I'm just going to tell you a little bit about some of the findings um, that have been so seminal uh, to the ABLE study over the last 15 years. So I mentioned um, the changes that occur in the brain, and I showed this slide earlier. And just um, focusing again on the cartoon on the right-hand side, where we see those brown sticky deposits of amyloid, and also those tangles within the, the purple brain cells. Well, in ABLE, we were able to implement state-of-the-art brain imaging technology to measure the levels of those proteins in the brain in a living individual. And prior to 2006, it really was unheard of. So ABLE was one of the first studies worldwide to implement this state-of-the-art brain imaging technology. And it's told us an awful lot about the way and the rate at which these proteins accumulate within the brain of individuals at all stages of the disease. So at the stage when they are thinking normally, but the changes are already occurring in the brain, 
at the stage when they have mild cognitive impairment, so there's some changes in their memory tests, but their day-to-day -day functioning is okay, and also the end stage when people have a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. So you can see on the slide, um, the, the pretty colors, as it were. So on the left-hand side, that's a tracer, as we refer to it, that binds to amyloid in the brain, and the more red the color, so the purple is zero value, and as it increases in levels, it goes up to around 3.4, um, and that's very high levels of amyloid in the brain, extremely high. And on the right, you can see the MK6240, and that's a tau binding tracer. So that binds to tau in the brain, and you can see that the distribution of tau is, is different to what we would see um, whether amyloid is accumulating within the brain, and the scale is also different. So what happens with these traces is someone is injected with either of them in their arm, um, and it mixes with the blood, crosses the blood-brain barrier, and enters the brain, and binds to these proteins, either amyloid or tau, depending on what you're injected with, and then the levels of um, the particular protein are visualized using something called positron emission tomography, so PET imaging. And this next video is what we've learned um, from the ABLE study about the natural history of amyloid beta and tau deposition in the brain. And the top two images show the brain um, and the changes in amyloid levels over time. And in the bottom two images, you can see the changes in tau over time. So I'll just play the video. Hopefully this works for us. So you can see that in the top image, the amyloid comes first. And as those um, changes become brighter and closer to red, the levels are really increasing. And when we're getting up to a value of around 100 on the centeloid scale, that's what we would expect to see in an Alzheimer's disease patient. And if I just play that image again, play, play the video again, you can see the tau comes after the amyloid. And the tau starts in one region of the brain in particular, and then starts to extend to other regions of the brain. And from start to finish, that is around 35 years that we've covered there, just in those few seconds. So it really does take a very long time for the uh, levels of the amyloid um, protein to accumulate in the brain and cause issues in terms of someone being diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. But we really know that that gives us a very large window of opportunity to intervene and change the trajectory or the disease course, if you like. And just to summarize those particular um, images there and the videos, so. What we've been able to see um, through the conduct of the ABLE study is that we've been able to cre create these curves here, which are shown on the slide, on the graph on the right-hand side. And you can see that in red, as I mentioned um, earlier, the amyloid changes start to occur very early on in the disease process. And then they're followed by tau-mediated um, injury to neurons. So the tau accumulates and starts causing damage to neurons. And then you get the brain structure changes, which we can visualize using a different type of imaging, this imaging up here in black and white, which we call magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI. So that's what's shown with this green curve here. And then after that, you have the changes in memory. And then later still, you have the clinical function changes. So we've been able to understand from the ABLE study that this really is a very protracted disease and takes a very long time to cause damage to the brain. So again, as I mentioned before, you've got around 17 to 20 years between someone being diagnosed as having cognitive, uh, being cognitively normal, so normal memory and thinking, to a diagnosis of dementia. But we know that significant changes are occurring in the brain in that period. And then around five to eight years between, to, between someone being in the mild cognitive impairment phase when they have normal day-to-day -day activities but impairment on memory and thinking tests to being diagnosed with dementia. Also what we've learned from the ABLE study is how important um, the interaction is between genes and um, an individual's variability or how, how good or, or necessarily not good they are at performing on tests of memory and thinking. 
And what we've seen is that it's certainly not a one-size-fits-all. And as you can see from the graph on the left side, so these are tests of um, what we call episodic memory, so just a, a particular type of memory. Um, we can see that the slope that's in red, these individuals are what we call ApoE4 carriers. So that means that they, uh, they possess the most common genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. And they also have amyloid in their brain. And we know that carrying the E4 allele can in, in contribute to increased rate of accumulating amyloid in the brain. But also, as you can see from this slide and this graph on the left, it contributes to much uh, faster decline in measures of memory. But then there's also this other gene that we call BDNF. So that stands for brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And if you have a certain a variant of that gene, if you combine that with the carriage of E4, so you've got E4 allele in the ApoE4, so the um, ApoE E4 plus BDNF variant, and then you get much faster decline. So the point that I'm trying to make is that there are genes at play which can influence the rate at which we decline, as well as we, at the rate at which we accumulate amyloid in the brain. We've also been able to understand from the ABLE study that beyond uh, deficits in memory, which were shown on the previous slide, also short-term learning is very important and perhaps even more sensitive for being able to pick up individuals who are on the pathway to developing Alzheimer's disease as compared to those who aren't. And colleagues of ours in, in the eastern states, um, led by Yen Yin Lim, developed a test called ORCA. And it's a computerized test, and it's based around learning a new language, in particular learning a Korean um, a characters and, and learning how to understand and memorize a Korean characters that appear on a screen. And the, this is repeated over six days, so it's quite an intense process. But what was shown was that individuals who have amyloid in the brain already have a much... Um, poorer performance on the ORCA test, this computerized test of uh, short-term learning, as compared to individuals without amyloid. So this is very important. And in fact, um, it was much more accurate at predicting uh, deficits and in memory and thinking compared to other tests that we have, uh, have been using in ABLE. So as I mentioned earlier, ABLE has been really important for understanding the stages of the disease. But also, it's very clear that there's a large window of opportunity to modify disease course, which is really encouraging. And it's also why early diagnosis is so important. So again, as I mentioned before, one of the things that sets ABLE apart is looking at how lifestyle impacts the rate at which an individual uh, declines, or also how it might protect, uh, protect someone against developing uh, dementia in the future. And some of the work that's come out of ABLE has looked at diet and physical activity, which um, Associate Professor Brown will speak about later, and also at sleep. And what we've seen is that adherence to the Mediterranean diet can actually counteract the negative effect of carrying a genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. So I mentioned that ApoE E4 gene earlier. So if you have the ApoE E4 gene, but you adhere strongly to the Mediterranean diet, you can actually um, improve the rate at which your memory changes over time. And when we drilled down into this work, we found that adhering to the Mediterranean diet is also associated with a slower rate of accumulating amyloid in the brain. And in particular, fruit was very strongly related to these results. We're not exactly sure why. We think it might be a combination of vitamin C, um, something that we call polyphenols, which are present in a lot of fruit, as well as other factors. And we also know that sleep is playing an increasingly important role. So previously, it had been thought that disruptive sleep was merely a symptom of Alzheimer's disease. And whilst that is true, it certainly is a symptom, we now are understanding that poor sleep over time, and particularly in midlife, can increase your likelihood of developing Alzheimer's disease in the future. And work by my PH student, uh, Louise Pivak, who's pictured here, has actually shown that individuals with poor sleep efficiency, so uh, sleep efficiency is the time in bed spent asleep. So if you're lying in bed but you're not sleeping, um, but it's very poor, you're at a much greater chance of um, accumulating amyloid faster in the brain. And the reason for that is because the 
the brain's housekeeping system, called the glymphatic system, is most active when we're sleeping, and particularly during deep sleep. So just to summarize, what have we learned from this wonderful study over the last 15 years? Well, through ABLE, we have been able to make world-class contributions to understanding the natural history of Alzheimer's disease progression. Uh, we understand the very slow accumulation rate of um, pathologic change in the brain, such as amyloid beta. And we've been able to use um, amyloid beta imaging to understand diagnosis and also prognosis as someone's likelihood of developing Alzheimer's disease in the future. We also know, encouragingly, that there's a very wide uh, window of opportunity for prevention trials and potential strategies using ABLE data have been identified. And this new knowledge, which is really important, has been translated to the design and implementation of trials which are aimed at preventing progression of dementia from Alzheimer's disease. And these trials include the A4 study, which has been primarily run in the US, and also the AU Arrow study, which is being run here in Perth and also in Sydney. And that's a multimodal lifestyle study which looks at uh, modifying someone's physical activity and their diet and also cardiovascular risk to prevent the onset of dementia. We also know from ABL that there's an important interplay between lifestyle and genes. Um, and that leads a uh, question of whether we might be able to use that information in the future to design, per design personalized intervention, intervention strategies. So knowing that it's not a one size fits all. And I think, um, collectively, this information really highlights the importance of observational studies such as ABLE. Sometimes people say to me, but why don't you just go straight to a clinical trial? And the answer is because we need to understand when to intervene and how to intervene. And ABLE has been really important for helping us understand those points. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, ABLE study participants, their families, and the broad ABLE study team. All right, thank you. Uh, there are a couple of questions from the audience. Now, we do have two people, uh, one in each aisle with microphones. Um, and because we are recording this session, um, it's really important that um, before answering your question, you wait for the microphone to come to you so we can all hear your question. So if anyone has a question for Stephanie, please raise your hand. Right, right down the front here. Um, Shima will come down. Is there another one while we're getting that one organised? And another one down here, Ron. Thank you for that great talk. Um, yeah, you mentioned sleep. I've never been a great sleeper, but I take a few things to help me sleep. And consequently, I sleep quite well. Um, so would that be of benefit? If you're not a great sleeper, is it good to take stuff that helps you to sleep so you can avoid getting those amyloids? Something is better than nothing, that's a certain. So if you're taking something and you help you believe it's improving your sleep, then that's great. Um, sometimes, depending on which um, drug you're taking, it may not um, directly affect the what we call sleep architecture. So, for example, the time spent in deep sleep, which is really important for flushing out amyloid and tau, which accumulate in the brain during the day. Um, so it, it depends on what you're taking. But as I said before, certainly improving sleep so that you're getting some sleep is, is better than doing nothing. I'm happy to tell you what I am taking. <laughs> well, let's have that conversation perhaps after the session. <laughs> Thank <Okay>. you. <laughs> Thank you. Is this on? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, Professor uh, uh, Stephanie has to try. Um, there's been some information that the amyloid beta theory has some doubts. Are you able to expand on that? Um, if you're referring to the recent um, incident with uh, some animal data that was brought into question. The imaging data which was brought into question. Yeah. Pardon, the animal data. Uh, yes, yeah. Uh, right. Um, so, <laughs> 
Whether amyloid is primarily the cause or of Alzheimer's disease or whether it's a biomarker, so it gives us information about the stage of disease that you're at, um, it's still important. It's an important part of the story. And we certainly know, um, not just us here in Australia, but around the world, that um, you saw those S-shaped curves, as it were, that accumulates in the brain slowly, then rapidly, and then reaches a peak and stays there. So there is more to be understood about how it impacts uh, the brain and whether it's truly causative or whether it is downstream of other uh, processes that cause the disease. But we certainly do know that it, it does have a role to play. And the other um, evidence that's in its favour in terms of having some type of role that contributes to the development of Alzheimer's disease is the studies where we know individuals have a genetic mutation in the genes that cause the production of amyloid. So when individuals have particular mutations in those genes and the levels of amyloid shoot through the roof, um, these individuals all end up with Alzheimer's disease. So you're right, we don't know if it's truly causative or if it's um, just telling us about the stage of disease. And certainly uh, the drug trials that have targeted thus far have had limited success. Um, however, there's a possibility that we are targeting a uh, too later stage of the disease or perhaps we need to take more than a one-pronged approach. Perhaps we need to take a multi-pronged approach to treating the disease. In, in your ABLE study, did you start with people who were showing signs of Alzheimer's? We started with individuals who were cognitively normal, um, and then we followed them over time, some for 15 years. And then we also started with individuals who um, are called mild cognitively impaired, so they have um, some poorer performance on measures of cogn cognition, so memory and thinking, uh, but otherwise normal day-to-day -day activities, and some individuals who already have Alzheimer's disease. So we looked at those three groups of individuals and followed them over time. So we saw some of the cognitively unimpaired individuals transition to MCI and AD, a lot of the MCI individuals transition to AD, and then, of course, we lost some of the Alzheimer's patients along the way. Uh, did you notice that transition to be markedly different between the two categories? Uh, yes, well, I think that's what those curves are showing is that there are clear um, levels of the what we refer to as biomarkers, so the indicators of the disease. There are what we call thresholds where we could um, identify individuals as crossing across and in, uh, moving across into those different diagnostic categories. Okay, thank you. I think there might be one more question um, up, up, up there, and otherwise we will have a Q&A session at the end where everyone will have the opportunity to ask some more questions. Uh, uh, one last one. Okay, um, sorry. Um, thank you. It was a good, lovely talk. Um, I suffer from sleep apnea, being diagnosed for about five years, and I wear a cap, is it, or a dark blade, blade, a mask? CPAP, yes. CPAP, that's the one. Now, um, right, short-term memory loss. Oh, <laughs> Yes, has there been any studies on, on the use of a CPAC in terms of um, dementia? Uh, there are some that are underway. There's a lot of data out there that suggests that uh, sleep apnea does increase your likelihood of developing um, Alzheimer's in the future and other forms of dementia. And the reason for that is because... Um, so obstructive sleep apnea um, causes you to continually wake up during the night because you stop breathing and your oxygen levels drop rapidly. And you suddenly uh, wake up and your sympathetic nerve system kicks in, so your heart starts beating rapidly, um, obviously to get the oxygen back around the body. And you can imagine what that does to your sleep. So your sleep is very interrupted. And also the time that you can spend in deep sleep when a lot of these toxins that are accumulating uh, during the day, such as amyloid, can be swept out is interrupted. Um, so there is evidence out there to suggest certainly that um, sleep apnea, um, or obstructive sleep apnea, increases the likelihood of developing MCI and dementia. And I am involved in a clinical trial at the moment that's uh, looking at how we could... Uh, design a beneficial intervention that isn't just based around continuous positive airway pressure, which is what you're referring to. Um, also, we know that obstructive sleep apnea is associated with other changes in the brain, such as um, what we call oxidative stress. So you've got molecules being produced that damage the brain cells. And we, we also think that that has a role to play in, in causing the symptoms uh, such as impaired um, memory and thinking. Is, is having a CPAC 
Useful? Yes, it's certainly useful. It's very important to address the what we refer to as the hypoxia, so the drops in oxygen levels that you have um, in your blood during the night. And that's very important for um, risk, reducing your risk of heart attack and, and other adverse events. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephanie. I'd now like to introduce our next speaker, um, Associate Professor Hamid Sarabi. Um, Hamid is currently the Director of the Centre for Healthy Ageing and Associate Professor of Psychology at Murdoch University. Um, he has contributed to more than 85 papers and three book chapters uh, focused in this area of healthy ageing and dementia. Um, he'll be speaking to us today about sensory changes and the risks of dementia. Thanks. Thank you. Um, as um, Stephanie and Lisa mentioned, uh, we have a great number of individuals turning into um, older adulthood, and unfortunately, the risk of dementia significantly increases as we age. Uh, we know that um, currently the cost of dementia is significantly um, sort of destroying um, uh, different. Uh, economies and health uh, care providers and also health system due to the fact that government couldn't support or couldn't provide enough support for all the uh, cases that require support. But one of the interesting points here is that we have heard that Alzheimer's disease is the second cause or dementia is the second cause of death in Australia for women. Um, and men, and also for women, it's the first cause of death. However, these statistics have significantly changed over the last two years. In fact, it seems that Alzheimer's disease has passed ischemic heart disease as the primary cause of death over the last two years. And we don't know what is the reason for that. It could be social isolation related to COVID or COVID-related complications, or any other cause, but unfortunately, dementia seems to be the primary cause these days for death in older adulthood. Um, and due to these uh, numbers, definitely whatever we do to decrease the risk of dementia and also the risk of future death due to dementia is a great help for everybody, including the healthcare system, the government, taxpayers, and us as potential individuals who may develop Alzheimer's. So I'm going to talk about um, what we have learned from WA memory study. Those of you who have been participating in memory study know that we have been interested in uh, assessing olfactory function or smell abilities. And the reason for that was that we noticed that smell dysfunction happens with age. Also, it's related to sex and also brain injury. However, on top of all of these three factors, we know that olfactory dysfunction is related to dementia and also mild cognitive impairment, or MCI. Um, one of the interesting points here is that um, in 1980s, mid-1980s, uh, there was a paper that was ignored quite uh, rapidly for some reasons, and nobody knows why, um, but they found uh, neurofibrillary tangles and also amyloid plaques in the olfactory system before it gets into the brain. So for that paper, sort of, people thought that, oh, this is referring to uh, nose as the cause of Alzheimer's disease and dementia, and potentially that was one of the reasons that um, it went silent. However, as time passed and more research was done on olfactory system, we noticed that, in fact, our smell sense goes down quite rapidly before any other signs and symptoms in dementia. And it's interesting to note that um, uh, it seems that amyloid beta by itself um, can uh, hinder the olfactory bulb uh, activity, and therefore our ability to smell decreases. So these findings tell, told us that, OK, maybe olfactory dysfunction could be considered as a pathway to screen those who are at higher risk of Alzheimer's disease. We noted, as uh, Stephanie quite um, correctly pointed, that um, amyloid beta and uh, 
uh, visualized through PET and tau visualized through PET also are great help for us to identify and confirm the presence of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, the problem with PET is that it's not available everywhere and also it's extremely costly. Not everybody is uh, interested to get into the PET machine. So to identify those who are at higher risk so that we can funnel those who should go and do PET, potentially a smell sense is one path. What we did over the last um, 12 years, 11 years or so, was to look into the relationship between change in smell and also future dementia. And also we looked at how olfactory dysfunction can be related to what we call as subjective memory complaints. Subjective memory complaints is actually a very preclinical stage of uh, potentially dementia that we've been interested in through our memory study and we've been trying to see those who are complaining about their memory are at higher risk or not. So as a preclinical stage to Alzheimer's, then potentially if smell sense is related to it, could be another indicator that to um, the, the two of them together can be used for screening those at higher risk. So we started the olfactory assessment in our memory study sometime in 2006. And as you can see, we noted that in fact, age is significantly related to our ability to smell, which is um, shown under the T4 threshold. However, we also noticed that um, olfactory discrimination, or D, our ability to differentiate between smells, is related, as you can see, significantly to memory complaints, or MFQ measure, also to age, and also to mini mental state examination, which is a measure of cognition. And also to GDS, which is, it's not related, which is a measure of depression. So later on, what we did was to see if all of these different changes in smell sense can make sense in terms of cognition. How does it relate to cognitive changes as compared to just memory complaints or to uh, global cognitive ability? So we went on and continued our assessments and we found that in fact, oops, we found that in fact, uh, change in olfaction is related to a sp uh, specific uh, types of cognitive abilities that we call them episodic memory. And that tells us, episodic memory, that a person is at higher risk of Alzheimer's disease. Again, as Stephanie pointed out, learning, specifically verbal learning, could be a precursor to future loss of other cognitive functions, including episodic memory, but we noted for a smell sense that it actually happens far before any significant change in episodic memory or ability to remember uh, different um, events. So after we learned about the relationship between a smell and also cognition and future risk of dementia, we decided that, okay, maybe uh, our test of a smell is not the best measure for olfaction. What we should do if we believe that memory is the key for Alzheimer's disease, is to develop a measure that actually assesses olfactory memory rather than just olfactory by itself. So instead of assessing, is this person capable of uh, smelling anything at all? Or can they differentiate between smells and so on? We came up with what we call WA olfactory memory test, uh, which is now published, and our uh, ex-PhD uh, student uh, Rasangi um, from, from UWA uh, started to collect data on it and see how it works. And she published a great paper just uh, came out a month or two ago. And in that paper, she actually showed that our olfactory memory test um, is quite significantly related to all measures of cognitions, uh, cognition that we have been collecting in our WA memory study. And this is quite a great achievement because when we started working on WA olfactory memory test, we really uh, were not sure if it relates to episodic memory at all or not. But here, as you can see, all of those stars shows us that olfactory 
um, memory is related to all the other measures that assess uh, our episodic memory um, and they're sort of noted there under CVLT2 trial 1 to 5, uh, short delay free recall, and so on. But I don't want to go through all the details of that. What we want to uh, indicate is that our WA olfactory memory test performed very well to be related to episodic verbal memory, which is a primary sign of Alzheimer's disease. And now we want to go further and test it in different cohorts to see if it really matters from one group of individuals to another group and how it performs for men versus women and for different ethnic groups. Also, we want to see if our WA olfactory memory test relates to PET imaging and also blood biomarkers that can identify people at higher risk of Alzheimer's. So that's for olfaction. Then we also started to look at hearing loss and its relationship to Alzheimer's. As you can see, change in hearing loss um, is increasingly happening as we age, unfortunately. And this graph may seem a bit familiar if you have seen a graph about dementia that tells us that, in fact, dementia increases with age in men and women as well. And the trajectory of change over time is similar to uh, hearing loss. So this tells us that maybe these two are related and maybe there are some relationship that can be picked up by some assessments and those can be used then later on to identify those who are at higher risk of Alzheimer's. Although previously we were more enthusiastic to sort of think that oh, maybe hearing loss is the cause of dementia, but now we are not that enthusiastic, but we see it as a contributing factor rather than a cause. So here in this uh, more recent graph, as you, you can see, it seems that in people with dementia, hearing loss is far more common compared to those who are not dementia patients. And as time passes, the um, hearing loss is more pronounced in, in dementia individuals or those who are at risk of dementia. So again, we decided that, okay, all of these um, uh, results are available to us and we can make sense of them, but what can we add to it? So we came up with our own hearing loss and dementia project within the um, ARF, Australian Alzheimer's Research Foundation, and in collaboration with um, Ear Science Institute, we decided to do some interesting uh, assessments on our WA memory study participants uh, and, and see if they have hearing loss and if they have, are they at higher risk of developing cognitive decline and hearing impairment. And one of our PhD students, Hadil, is, is um, now working uh, on her thesis to, to get it ready for submission she actually found quite interesting results. As you can see through the publications that have come up from our lab, we have noted that hearing loss is related to dementia. We have also found that there are two, both different uh, types of hearing loss, central and peripheral, are related to dementia and risk of cognitive impairment. And also we noted that most of the research that has been previously published were using measures that are verbally loaded or verbally mediated. So if we know a person is at uh, risk of hearing loss and we test their cognition, their ability to uh, memorize information and recall and so on through using verbally mediated measures, then we are not giving them the advantage of using their cognitive abilities to the best. So what we did was to come up with a measure which was non-verbal and we still saw the same effect and the relationship stayed between hearing loss and cognitive impairment. And currently, Hadil is working on uh, assessing auditory through using electrophysiological measures. The reason for this is that any hearing assessment or audiometry assessment that you um, could be familiar with uh, relies on your ability to pay attention and also relies on your ability to communicate. 
The problem is that when it comes to Alzheimer's patients, they may not be able to uh, focus their attention for a long period of time, and also their ability to react to a stimulus may not be as quick and good as we want it. To prevent that disadvantage that may come due to Alzheimer's, uh, electrophysiological assessment of, of hearing is pretty important because it doesn't require that much involvement from the patient themselves. So the patient can sit there, we um, use the, the uh, electrodes on, on uh, their scalp and then we assess the um, different, uh, different uh, uh, results that come up in response to a stimulus from electrophysiological recording. So this is pretty interesting because the person, as I said, requires minimum effort. So what we have learned from all of these different assessments? We have learned that, in fact, change in sensory abilities um, can be related to future risk of dementia. We have also learned that significant decline in any specific sensory can be related to uh, risk of dementia independent of any other sensory change. Hearing loss is independently uh, related to uh, dementia as is olfactory dysfunction and olfactory loss. So um, one, one of the interesting uh, sort of uh, outcomes of these two uh, studies is that we have come up with a package to put all of them together to see how much added value we can get if we stepwise do one after another and see that we can better um, um, predict future risk of Alzheimer's disease. Also, it's of interest to us that no diagnostic um, textbook or no um, a definition of dementia uses sensory decline as one of the signs of dementia. Although, as I mentioned, we don't uh, believe that uh, sensory uh, uh, dysfunction can cause Alzheimer's disease specifically, but it contributes to dementia as a risk factor. And also, um, it may be a very good risk indicator for those who can develop Alzheimer's and other types of dementia. However, they haven't been quite acknowledged, these sensory changes, uh, for diagnosis and also for screening those who are at risk. And finally, the interesting point is that before we believe that olfactory dysfunction goes down as we age and there is nothing that we can do. Research now is coming out that in fact we can do a few things to improve our olfaction. What they call it as olfactory retraining is actually now a reality and that's interesting because if olfactory is manageable and hearing loss is manageable as we know through different uh, measures, then we are in good shape to potentially prevent uh, dementia to some degree um, as much as we can or identify those who are at risk and do some preventive measures. And by that, I'd like to thank all my collaborators and supporters of the study, as you can see. But the most importantly, our WA memory study have been significantly contributing to this research, as were our generous donors. Thank you. Uh, there are um, perhaps one question from each side of the auditorium. Thank you, over here. Has um, an extremely good um, talk. Has um, sensory or has the uh, sight been uh, investigated as much as the olfactory, uh, as much as the hearing? And do hair, hair aids and spectacles help? Any information about that? Yes. Thank you. That's, that's a great question. Uh, in fact, we have started working on I also simultaneously to other measures back in 2000 and I think seven or eight. And um, one of our PhD students um, who is now a uh, senior researcher himself um, has been at CSIRO. Um, he's been showing through ABLE study and also through memory study that changes in the eye can be visualized 
by imaging and also those changes are related to future risk of Alzheimer's. Currently, uh, Professor Ralph Martins has managed to um, purchase a very unique measure for eye imaging that actually um, tries to capture amyloid accumulation in retina. And that will be very helpful because if we show that amyloid actually starts accumulating in retina, then we can understand that why some of uh, individuals with Alzheimer's disease have difficulties in what we call as visual constructional abilities or ability to draw something, ability to read maps, ability to make sense of their surroundings and so on. So definitely eye plays a significant role. The reason that I haven't brought it here because the results are still under investigation. Thank you for your talk. Um, I'm interested in the fact that there are differences between the types of causes of hearing loss. You, you might um, have it, I suppose, genetically predetermined just because of old age advancing, but it might arise from, say, uh, exposure to industrial noise or things of that nature. So in your uh, work, have you differentiated between those two? Yeah. Is, is, is the, uh, well, if, you, if I see you're nodding, so I'll just let you answer. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So that's, that's a good question. I wanted to clarify that, uh, in fact, as you mentioned, there are different types of hearing loss, congenital and non-congenital hearing loss. What we have seen to be related to risk of Alzheimer's and other types of dementia is age-related hearing loss rather than genetic hearing loss. Did that answer your question? Uh, yeah, well, yes, it does at the basic level. So d does that suggest then that the hearing loss is, uh, that arises genetically, uh, that there's a, just a correlation between um, the, the, that it's in your genes, so to speak, and both are, it's an indicator, not, not that the hearing loss is uh, some sort of um, uh, reason why you you might um, uh, ha have dementia problems. Yeah. So um, as as I mentioned, um, there are individuals who have lost their hearing from very early stage due to genetic reasons. Uh, these individuals apparently show some brain reorganization that can cope with the changes over time and the change in their hearing loss is not gradual and progressive. It has happened and that's it. And their brain starts to uh, reorganizing itself, getting the best out of the situation, relying on other senses and so on. However, with progressive um, change in our hearing, it seems that there is a significant relationship with dementia. And also I should say that one of the reasons that it is uh, sort of correlated with, with dementia is the um, interference with our daily living activities, including increased risk of depression in those with age-related hearing loss and social isolation and all the other outcomes that hearing loss brings. So hearing loss by itself is not a cause, but it's one of the risk factors that can contribute. All of the risk factors together increase our chances of developing dementia. Thank you. That's very interesting. I'd now like to welcome Associate Professor Belinda Brown to the stage. Um, Belinda is the Deputy Director, Centre for Healthy Ageing and Head of Graduate Education and Training at Murdoch University. Her research is primarily focused on understanding the role of lifestyle in maintaining a healthy ageing brain and preventing cognitive decline and dementia. Today, Belinda will be presenting on the topic of exercise and dementia. Thanks very much for that introduction, Lisa. Um, so as Lisa mentioned, today we're talking about dementia and exercise. 
I will be flipping in between the terms physical activity and exercise, and in fact, they are actually kind of different. Physical activity is any movement that you do with your body that expends energy, um, and exercise is any structured form of physical activity. So if you go out for a walk for the purpose of being healthy, then that's exercise, for example. So I'll interchange a little bit, but essentially both of them involve moving your body and getting healthier. So just to start, I'm not going to go through what dementia is because you've, you've heard that, um, but any questions, please ask at the end. I wanted to start with the opportunity for intervention. So a few of the facts you've probably heard um, have been a little bit a little bit doom and gloom that you know dementia is becoming more prevalent, but there is that opportunity for us to intervene earlier. We know that currently there isn't a cure available and the costs associated with dementia care um, are set to really increase in the coming decades. Current Alzheimer's treatments do alleviate the symptoms for a short period and that's fantastic that there is something available, but this isn't um, working at all patients and it usually only lasts for a few years as well. So by the time someone's actually diagnosed with um, dementia, specifically Alzheimer's disease, what we think has happened is that the damage um, has occurred and it's occurred to a stage where it's no longer able to be reversed. So there's a real growing evidence that we intervene early before clinical symptoms occur. Um, and in particular, in terms of that intervention, we're looking at modifiable risk factors. So, th so things in your daily life that you could potentially change to decrease your risk of developing dementia in the future. So this next slide pulls together um, some work from what we call the Lancet Commission on Dementia Prevention. Really, it was just a large worldwide study from some of the leading uh, researchers in dementia prevention. And they essentially gathered all of the evidence in the scientific literature and pulled together what they thought were the things that are most likely to contribute to dementia risk. And these are the ones from late life with some that I've added. I've taken a bit of a liberty here. Um, so what they found was that depression, diabetes, social isolation, smoking, air pollution, and physical inactivity were the greatest risk factors for dementia in later life. And I've added on sleep and diet because we know from the work that we've done in the ABLE study that these are also really important. So if physical inactivity is a risk factor for dementia, physical activity has been shown to be a protective factor against dementia. And that's what I'm gonna to talk to you about today. So what I'll show you is some of the kind of larger studies have, have been done and also a synthesis of all of the work that's been done rather than little bits of information. So I wanted to start by talking to you about physical activity and cognition. And some people might ask, why does it really matter if physical activities related to cognition, if it's going to decline anyway due to dementia. So the reason that we study this is if you think of your, your cognition levels now, say they're here, if you can increase them with physical activity, there's a lot further to fall when it comes to the dementia cascade. This is something we call reserve and we believe that physical activity can contribute to your cognitive reserve. So that increase that keeps you further away from that dementia diagnosis. So there's a lot of evidence that higher levels of physical activity, so just more movement in your daily life, whether it be exercise, housework, gardening, etc., higher levels of physical activity are associated with better verbal memory, so remembering things that have been spoken to you and saying them back, um, remembering a list of words, for example. And this particular cognitive function is controlled by an area of the brain called the hippocampus. And this is just a small region of the brain that's the first affected in Alzheimer's disease. High levels of physical activity are also associated with a cognitive function called executive functioning. And this is more of a higher order cognitive function. Um, it involves a number of different brain processes and it's really important in everyday function. Um, being able to keep your activities of daily living are really um, important when it comes to executive function as well. And this is controlled by the prefrontal cortex, so the front area of the brain. I wanted to point out those two regions of the brain because interestingly, the areas of the brain that are most affected by dementia and aging appear to be those that also gain the most benefit in terms of physical activity. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a couple of slides. But then we move on to physical activity and dementia risk. So the way that most of these studies have been run 
is they're usually quite large cohort studies, similar to that of ABLE that Stephanie was explaining earlier, where they might take baseline levels of physical activity in people, say, their, their 30s, 40s or 50s, and track them over decades, and decades later see have they developed dementia. Uh, this was a study that was conducted in Japan, and what they found was that physical activity um, was a really strong predictor of developing dementia later in life, or a protective factor. So pulled straight from the paper, they've said expenditure of 500 kilocalories over a week um, resulted in a decrease of 10% risk in all-cause dementia, which is that ACD, or 13% de decrease risk in Alzheimer's disease. So you're probably thinking, what is 500 kilocalories? And it actually depends completely on, um, say, your gender, your age, um, how much you weigh is very important. But um, I asked an exercise scientist colleague of mine to just, just, just give me a number so that I can tell people what this means. So say for um, a gentleman that's 60 years old, uh, weighs about 70 kilos, this would be three times a week, a 30 minute walk. Um, and give or take that, depending on your um, individual characteristics, it's not a huge amount, really. Um, but what this particular study found, so that's the basic PA dose per week where there was a 10% decrease or 13% if it was Alzheimer's specifically, double that and there was another decrease in risk of that exact amount. Um, so really interesting study showing that, um, that physical activity is really important. But one thing to keep in mind here that I will touch on a little bit, bit later is individual variability, that nobody will be having the same response to physical activity. So some people within this study might have had a reduced risk of say 20, 30%, whereas some people may get no effect. Um, so do keep that in mind. So there has been work that's shown that exercise interventions can actually increase the volume of the brain. So there is an old school of thought that I know that I was told as a kid that you're born with a certain number of um, brain cells or neurons, um, as you get older, they die off and there's no way that any can regenerate or grow again. This has shown to be disproven um, and in fact physical activity and exercise has been shown to be one of the things that can uh, regenerate brain cells within particular regions of the brain. In particular, I wanted to show you a study that was done by a collaborator of mine at the University of Pittsburgh. And what he showed was just that walking three times a week uh, for 50 minutes at a time was able to increase the volume of the hippocampus. Remember, that's the area of the brain that's vital for learning and memory, and it's the first to shrink in Alzheimer's disease. So he was able to show that um, just by doing this intervention for one year, so walking three times a week for 50 minutes, could increase the volume of that hippocampus. Similar into the way that I explained cognitive reserve, we could talk about brain reserve, which is increasing the volume of the brain from what it is now, it's further for you to come down to reach those kind of clinical levels um, that could be associated with a dementia diagnosis. Some of the work um, that we have done, particularly through ABLE, has shown that exercise is also associated with lower dementia pathologies. And this is the amyloid beta and tau that we were talking about earlier. So you might have heard that in animal studies, physical activity, um, or, or pretty much anything, um, can cure Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease in animals has been cured by many, many things, and exercise is one of them. So animal studies have shown that exercise can reduce both amyloid beta and tau back to normal in animals that are predisposed to um, accumulating them. However, the studies from humans have not been so um, consistent, and one of them I will show you on the next slide. Um, but what I've shown here is actually a review that I did a few years ago that showed how complicated the um, relationship was and all of the different ways in which exercise could be influ influencing things within your brain to reduce those dementia pathologies. So it's not just one thing that's happening, um, it's many things. And this is just the effect that's happening on amyloid beta and tau. It doesn't um, allude to other changes such as changes in insulin resistance, um, vascular changes, uh, brain oxygenation um, and many other changes in the brain that could be occurring as a result of physical activity. So one of the first studies that I ever actually did as a part of my PhD was looking at physical activity levels and amyloid in the brain and this came out of the ABLE study. So what we actually found um, was that 
people reporting the lowest levels of physical activity and had the highest genetic risk, so carriers of that APOE E4 allele, had the most amyloid. So we know that people that carry E4 have high levels of amyloid, um, and in addition, these people had low levels of physical activity. What was interesting is that those that still had that great genetic risk, so carriers of the APOE4 allele, yet they were reporting high levels of physical activity, actually had kind of lower levels of beta amyloid in the brain, so that kind of below our positive threshold. Um, so essentially what we were seeing here is that physical activity could possibly be mitigating that increased risk that's associated with carrying that genetic risk factor. So four very important things when it comes to exercise. Frequency, intensity, time and type, and we call it the FIT, F-I-T-T. -T. Unfortunately, in terms of physical activity and brain health, we don't have a lot of answers here. We know physical activity is good, we know exercise is good, but with all the research that we've done to date, we still don't exactly know what within all of these aspects is the best. One thing I'm really interested in within my research program is intensity. And a year or so ago, we completed the intense physical activity and cognition study. And within this study, we had 100 um, older adults aged 60 to 80. They underwent um, MRI scans, memory and thinking tests, and we also did um, genetics on them as well. So all of our participants were randomised into one of three groups, an inactive control group, a moderate intensity group that cycled in our labs twice a week at a, a moderate pace, or our high intensity group that did interval training on our bikes in the lab twice a week for six months as well. And then again, after the six months, they had the brain scans and memory thinking tests again. So as expected, our high intensity group who were doing interval training twice a week um, in our labs had really big increases in cardiorespiratory fitness. So their bodies obviously changed, they became a lot fitter. Our moderate intensity group also increased their fitness, just not to the same extent as the high intensity group. And our control group didn't change in terms of fitness over that time, <laughs> on average, not surprisingly. When we looked at the memory and thinking tests, we actually didn't see any differences in change from baseline to six months across those different groups. So when we compared the mean change across those groups, we didn't see any differences. But we did see some differences in moderate intensity and high intensity group. And we could see that some people had improved their memory. So we delved into that a little bit further. And what we found is that, so improved fitness that's along the horizontal, um, and we have cognition improvements along the vertical axis, is that you needed to have improvements in your fitness from the intervention to have improvements in your cognition, um, so your memory and thinking skills. So this adds to a kind of quite increasing body of literature that's showing you have to have the entire body physical benefits to also get the brain benefits. Unfortunately, some people don't get as much benefit from physical activity um, in terms of body and brain. We still don't know why. It's likely based on genetic factors that we've yet to identify. Um, but we do know the majority of people do. Uh, it certainly doesn't mean that other areas such as um, vascular and um, insulin resistance aren't getting benefit. But in terms of the brain health, we're seeing really important that cardiorespiratory fitness increases. It could be that the people at the bottom were already very fit. The people that didn't have big increases in fitness, they were already very fit. Um, they needed a lot more exposure to exercise to incre increase their fitness. So there's a lot that we still don't know in this area. Um, what is the best type of exercise? Is it dancing? Is it doing something that you love rather than something that you have to do? Um, is quantity of sleep important and we know that they interact and myself and Associate Professor Rainey Smith have a student working on this right now. Um, and also specific dietary components. Is it important what you're eating after you exercise as well? A question I get a lot is what age do you need to start? And I think when it comes to physical activity or exercise, there, there is no age. The age that you are today, if you're not doing it already, is a great time to start on doctor's advice, of course. And one of the areas of research that I'm really, really interested in is why are people benefiting more than others? So we do a lot of work in genetics, but also looking at other factors, um, such as your gender, your age. 
is it that you're getting more benefit at certain ages or um, different genders getting different benefits as well? So this is an area of research that I'm really interested in and will continue into the future. So I think that that's everything that I wanted to take you through today. Um, and I'd just like to thank the team that worked on the, the IPAC study, which is our intensity study, um, and the funding bodies as well. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, you mentioned uh, positive, uh, possible interaction effects. Um, could you speak briefly about the possibility of socialising whilst exercising in this? Yes, absolutely. That's a really good point that I didn't bring up. So all of the exercise interventions that we run, um, our control group also has to have a social aspect because it's so important. If we had an exercise group and a control group that did absolutely nothing, and our exercise group are doing it together and socialising, it's completely kind of throws off the study because the socialisation is so important in terms of brain health, and we do know that. Um, so, yeah, it's a very, very important aspect. Um, and it's something that actually hasn't been done is comparing exercise by yourself versus exercise in groups, and I think that that's something that we could look at in the future, for sure. Thank you. Um, thank you. Were you able to correlate sleep and the exercise activity to see whether there was a relationship, particularly glymphatic washout. Yeah, so um, one of our, study, our students, um, Kelsey Sewell, has looked into this recently and she didn't see strong relationships between um, exercise and sleep. There is some, but these were based on self-reported measures as well. So the next step is to look at um, devices that people have worn. Um, to see the relationship between physical activity and sleep. Because it is quite well known that the more physically active you are, the more likely you are to have good quality sleep at night. Okay, thank you. I'd like to invite, uh, thank you very much, Belinda. I'd like to invite to the um, stage um, Associate Professor Roger Clarnett. Um, while he's coming forward, Dr. Roger Clarnett works at the Fremantle Hospital in the Department of Geriatric Medicine. Uh, he's a director of the Memory Evaluation Unit at the hospital, which provides comprehensive neuropsychological evaluation for patients with cognitive and behavioural deficits. Um, Dr. Clarnett also manages the aged care assessment team at the Department of Community and Geriatric Medicine. Um, today, Dr. Clarnett will be presenting on the current management and treatment for Alzheimer's disease and some of the new treatments being researched in, um, in Alzheimer's disease. Thank you, Dr. Thanks, Lisa. Hello, everyone. I'm going to talk about a clinical approach, specifically my clinical approach to managing Alzheimer's disease and dementia. I'll talk about medical management and lifestyle management. By far the most important of the two is lifestyle management, particularly nutrition. These are the current drugs that we have available for the management of the uh, treatment of Alzheimer's. The cholinesterase inhibitors and the NMDA antagonists have been available for over 20 years. They don't work very well. In some people, uh, there is a positive response, but in most who have an effect, they get a temporary stabilising effect and many patients don't respond at all. Suvenade is a nutritional supplement which also has a modest benefit, particularly in the mild impairment stage of the condition. So because these treatments don't really work very well, that's why the focus is on using experimental drugs. So these are the current trials that we're running at the foundation. And in the last 10 to 15 years, we've been focusing on using drugs that remove the amyloid peptide from the brain. And from a biological perspective, these drugs have been very effective. They do remove amyloid peptide from the brain. Unfortunately, there has been no evidence of a clinical effect as yet. And as we've previously heard, this may be because we're using these drugs too late in the disease history. 
the doses may be inadequate or there may be another factor that scientists haven't realised or it may be that they just don't work despite the biological effect. Last year in America, the regulatory authority approved the use of aducanumab because of its effect in removing brain amyloid. Unfortunately, the clinical effect of aducanumab was underwhelming and the funding bodies in North America refused to subsidise the drug. So it's, it's really gone off the radar. But we, we are currently still using this drug in a current study and we're about to start another study in the next few months before the end of the year, which is a post-marketing uh, phase four study. We're also using two other monoclonal antibodies that remove amyloid. The gantanerumab study will hear the results of that study in late November. So we're, that's a, a highly anticipated uh, press release that we're waiting for and we hope that there will be a clinical effect of gantanerumab. We're also using an anti-tau monoclonal antibody. As we've heard, tau is the other implicated peptide that accumulates within brain cells and this study is looking at preventing further phosphorylated tau accumulation. And you can see that we're targeting the mild cognitive impairment stage of Alzheimer's disease in the hope that if we use these treatments early enough, we will have a clinical effect on the progression of the disease. We're also using an immune modulator, an anti-inflammatory drug, and also a, a drug that alters FLNA production. We've also got one study which delivers the drug intrathecally, so into the, directly into the cerebrospinal space via a lumbar puncture, and this is directed at uh, tau messenger RNA. So this is quite novel. This technique using antisense oligonucleotides has been used very successfully for other inflammatory conditions and metabolic conditions. So. Um, because of the nature of the delivery of the drug, we anticipate some difficulty recruiting for this, but if there's anyone in the audience who's willing, please let me know at the end of the talk. So I think we have to talk about Alzheimer's disease in the context of it being a chronic disease. So for the next few minutes, I'll just talk about the broad scope of chronic disease and where Alzheimer's fits into that and what we can potentially do to address that. And currently, as of the last week of August this year, looking at the clinical trials database from America, there are currently 684 experimental medical interventions for Alzheimer's disease worldwide. Um, and of course, for other chronic diseases, there are thousands upon thousands of uh, medical interventions currently being studied. And the reality is that most of these interventions will be found to be ineffective. And if they are found to be effective, many of them will be minimally effective. An example I use is the management of type 2 diabetes mellitus. We've had drugs for 40, 50 years to ameliorate the effect of high blood sugar, but none of these drugs actually address the underlying metabolic problem. And we do know that with lifestyle intervention, type 2 diabetes can be reversed, totally reversed. Uh, but the lifestyle intervention is not promoted by the medical profession and many patients find it too difficult. But the reality is type 2 diabetes can be reversed with nutritional intervention and people who successfully do this come off all of their drugs 
and they also revert to normal metabolic pro profiling on blood testing. So there is, type 2 diabetes is the prototype for a chronic disease that can be reversed with lifestyle management. Another reality is that few of our currently available drugs cure chronic disease. There have been some uh, magical pharmacological developments over the decades. Some cancers can be cured with drugs and uh, that's a triumph of science but in the large part most drugs do not cure chronic disease, they control that condition. So how should we approach chronic disease? We should use effective drugs if they are available and we should secondly implement meaningful lifestyle changes. So in this uh, context, why do humans get and stay sick? Now, if we think about the epidemic of chronic disease that has, has emerged in the industrialised world in the last 100 years, it all correlates with changes in lifestyle, particularly nutrition and sedentary behaviour. So I'm referring to obesity, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, autoimmune disease, inflammatory disease, such as arthritis, cancer and psychiatric conditions. All of these conditions have a metabolic and inflammatory basis. And if we correlate the use of uh, seed oils in our diet, excess eating and carbohydrate intake, the, the, the observational data shows close correlation with these changes in nutrition and the emergence of this epidemic of chronic disease. And it, it's estimated that in industrialised countries in North America, Europe and Australia, New Zealand, that over 80% of the population has evidence of metabolic dysfunction, which is the substrate for chronic disease. And metabolic dysfunction uh, is linked uh, inextricably to insulin resistance. Some of you may have heard of this term. Insulin is a very important uh, hormone uh, which relates to storage of energy and insulin resistance is the body's attempt to prevent the nutritional effects of the modern diet. So insulin resistance is a normal response but it has metabolic consequences. So let's think about a, a simple battery that we use in our homes in multiple devices. If the chemical constituents of these batteries is not exactly right, it will not work. It will not produce the energy that is its intended purpose. And similarly, in the body, the parts of our cellular architecture that produce energy, if they don't get the proper chemical inputs, uh, they will not work. So mitochondria are the biological batteries in all of our cells, except for red blood cells. Red blood cells don't have mitochondria, but every other cell in our body does. And life exists. Human life, mammalian life exists because mitochondria produce ATP, which is the way we fuel our metabolic and physiological processes. And if we don't fuel our mitochondria with proper nutrients, they cannot work. And with inadequate or suboptimal nutrition over many decades, metabolic insults accumulate and chronic diseases develop. So chronic diseases can be reversed with better nutrition uh, the prototype of this is type 2 diabetes. 
but other inflammatory conditions can be reversed with better nutrition, such as inflammatory bowel disease, many other autoimmune conditions. And the essence of this is a low carbohydrate diet. Carbohydrate is not an essential nutrient for humans. Um, the essential nutrients for humans uh, is high quality protein, high quality fat, vitamins and minerals. So carbohydrates um, make up most of the calories that each one of us eat each day. And I'm sure that would probably apply to over 90% of the people in this room. But they are in fact not essential uh, nutrients for humans. We also would recommend low seed oil intake. So a, a seed oil is any liquid oil. And these uh, oils were first developed in the 19th century to lubricate machines. And uh, the manufacturers of these oils thought, how can we expand our market? And they decided to target fellow humans. Um, so the first uh, industrialised seed oil was cotton seed oil and that's led to all sorts of other oils such as uh, grape seed oil, canola oil, safflower oil. So all of these oils are highly unstable and they oxidise at, at room temperature and they're very toxic when they're heated and used in cooking and unfortunately they're in most processed foods and fast foods and junk foods that we eat. So a, a lot of the dietary interventions have worked in recent decades, shown in studies, because uh, processed food has been taken out of these diets. So many vegetarians improve their health because they stop eating uh, processed foods which contain these toxic seed oils. Um, I'm not recommending a vegetarian diet, by the way, because uh, the most nutrient-dense foods for humans is, is meat. So uh, time-restricted eating is also important because humans are not designed to eat three meals a day. When we evolved, we didn't have access to a supermarket that was open 24 hours a day. We had to go and hunt food. And the anthropological literature clearly shows that humans evolved by eating meat, muscle meat and organ meat. And we needed insulin to kick in when we ate for the first time in a week. So when we eat three meals a day and have snacks in between, we're constantly stimulating our insulin levels and our insulin levels never get time to go back to normal. And this is the core of the metabolic stress that occurs and this is what drives chronic disease. So particularly for the type two diabetics or the people who are overweight that I see in my practice, I ask them to think about time-restricted eating, so eating within a certain window of hours each day, six to eight hours, 16 to 18 hours of fasting. That allows the insulin levels to go back to normal and restore normal metabolic function. And a focus on high nutrient density foods, such as meat and eggs. If an egg is good enough for a an embryonic chicken, it should be good enough for humans to eat. <laughs> so we shouldn't fear eating eggs for fear of eating cholesterol. If we reduce cholesterol in our diet, our livers just compensate anyway. So if you like uh, to eat cheese and ham omelettes, have one every day. Uh, you, we, humans are capable of digesting a dozen eggs a day if you're up to it. <laughs> so as I've uh, been in practice for over 40 years now, the more I practice, the more I realise how little I know. So I've adopted a Socratic approach to research and clinical practice. We have to be careful about how we interpret uh, scientific data. 
Uh, and this particularly comes to interpreting so-called scientific data on nutrition. You know, the idea that eating a steak is unhealthy is not right. Um, so I particularly like the quote from Richard Feynman regarding how uh, initial impressions from scientific data can be distorted and it becomes part of the cultural zeitgeist which is quite counterproductive to, to health. So to conclude, the prevention and management of Alzheimer's disease should focus on considering effective drugs and in this context we'd certainly urge people to try these drugs that we're using at the moment. They're all safe, they've all got through the safety uh, early phase studies and in recent years we have seen a couple of the drugs we've used show a clinical signal so I remain optimistic even though in 30 years of running these studies we've had only one or two that have shown a clinical effect and that's been minimal. I'd also, I also urge the people that I see to consider changes to nutrition as I've mentioned and of course, we can't neglect the, the benefits of an optimal social milieu. Humans are meant to interact with each other and uh, isolation uh, and loneliness is very detrimental to mental health. So I will finish the talk on this note and I'm happy to answer questions. Um, yes, please. Yes, my question relates to sports, and we're seeing an increasing amount of um, information coming out from complex, uh, contact sports. Um, would you like to comment on that and how that can be addressed? Yes, sure. Um, yes, you're right, that's a massive issue in sports, whether it be professional sport or amateur, which is probably a lot poor, more poorly managed in terms of concussion-related injuries. Um, there is some evidence that being incredibly fit may help mitigate some of the brain damage that occurs with concussion, but that would only be a small, small part. So really it is on the sporting codes themselves to actually take people off the field for long periods of time to recover or retire players, essentially, to reduce their risk of dementia in the future. But I know this is something Hamid has also worked on, so I'll pass over. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, um, of course, I, I think it, uh, the student you have, uh, uh, Sean Markowi, who's working on uh, brain injury and how it may potentially impact future risk of dementia and changes in uh, our ability to cope with dementia, has uh, done quite a series of studies. Um, of course, what <coughs> I've been interested in was that potentially brain injury and specifically traumatic brain injury from observational point of view, I should say that we only collected some preliminary data. And unfortunately, the study that we were supposed to do didn't continue due to funding. But um, what we have seen is that, in fact, brain injury significantly increases the risk of Alzheimer's disease and future dementia. Thank you. Uh, Shima, there's a lady in the white top in the middle here. And is there a question we can get to get ready for the left? We've got probably time for two more questions. Uh, Ron, there's one behind you. Um, thank you. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. It's been very interesting. Um, I have recently monitored my glucose using the new gadget and uh, the app on the phone. And one recording for two slices of raisin toast made, my <laughs> made the level go up above 10. And then it went crash and down below four. Um, how many people with dementia have this varying glucose, which I am working on? Uh, well, that, that's an interesting point because there is some evidence from the literature that a high fasting blood sugar 
in a cognitively normal person is a bigger risk factor for future Alzheimer's disease than age. So that informs the view that it's metabolic stress that is uh, a significant contributor. So um, fluctuations in blood sugar after a piece of bread, that, that is what happens. That's a physiological event because you're eating a carbohydrate-rich food. Those long chains of carbohydrates hit the liver as sugar molecules. You get a huge spike in insulin from eating raisin toast. Um, and then you get an overshoot. You get a, uh, the insulin suppresses the blood sugar by forcing it into the cells in muscle and liver. And often it overshoots to a low level and that uh, triggers hunger. And for many people it means they go for the next snack. And it's just a vicious cycle and insulin never stays low for long enough. So that's the classical biochemical response to uh, a carbohydrate load. So is there a relationship between a lot of um, all this glucose um, not keeping it at a normal level um, and the low GI, eating the low GIs more than the high GIs well, and I think so on. Or what's the risk yeah, low, of getting low Alzheimer's? Low GI foods are still sugar. It just means ah. it's delivered to the liver more slowly. But the, the, the metabolic dysfunction that occurs from that is probably uh, the same as eating a pound of chocolate. So the, the message that I think comes from the literature is restricting carbohydrate intake is what we should all be doing, Thank apart you. from those occasions where, you know, we've got a special event. <laughs> Thank you. Thank um, you someone has the microphone at the back here. Thank you. And then just one final question after this one. Thank you. Um, thank you all of you. It's been a very interesting afternoon. I'm interested to know um, more about the um, pollution, the impact of pollution on the brain and whether your view is that it's significant um, uh, or, or would your view still be that nutrition and exercise are, um, are more so? Where are you? I can't see you in the dark. Ah, there we are. Hi. Um, so the Lancet Commission that was published in 2020 um, actually added air pollution to the recommended list of 12 modifiable risk factors, which it believes accounts for 40% of cases of dementia worldwide. It wasn't in the previous um, iteration of the Lancet Commission for Dementia Prevention, but it is in this newest version. So they are clearly of the opinion that there's sufficient evidence to, to state that it is um, a risk factor. Why it might be a risk factor, it could be related to a number of factors. Um, it could be related to the fact that these uh, air pollutants can create oxidative stress in the brain and inflammation, which increases damage to neurons and can leave you at risk of, uh, of um, brain cell death and ultimately dementia. It could be, there could be other compounds potentially. I don't know if this was investigated, but perhaps um, individuals who, who are dwelling in these high density areas aren't, um, aren't as active or eating as well as, as their uh, country living counterparts. But regardless, the Dementia uh, Commission felt as strongly enough that it should be included. So yes, it is acknowledged as a risk factor. Thank you very much. I think we might... Oh, sorry, Roger. No, oh, I'll just add in a point. Air pollution, the pollutants in, um, from uh, exhaust fumes, for instance, it, it's toxic to the endothelium, which is the lining of our arteries, and it suppresses the production of a vitally important molecule called nitric oxide, and that can set off further metabolic cascades which are detrimental to brain function. Thank you. Um, could you all please join me in a very warm um, thank you to our speakers today. Thank you.